All right, if I could call us to some sort of order. Oh, you're very polite. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Mark Valeri, and as the interim director of the John C. Danforth Center on Religion and Politics, I welcome you this morning to Wash U and to this St. Louis Jewish Book Festival event. Bringing scholars together who study various aspects of religion and politics in American history and society, the Danforth Center is designed to nourish scholarship on and help foster a pluralistic and democratic public discourse. The Danforth Center also has a rich history of collaboration with the Jewish Community Center, and we are honored to help sponsor this event. The speaker and program will be introduced by Hannah Dinkle, who received her master's degree here at WashU. Hannah is the director of literary arts for the Jewish Community Center and is the chief organizer of the St. Louis Jewish Book Festival. The festival is now in its 45th year, and we are pleased that this year it takes place in these hallowed halls. Hannah. Thank you so much for the warm welcome, Mark. Um, as he said, we have many Washington University alumni present today, including myself and the impressive founder of this series, Dr. Arthur Gale. The Jewish Book Festival is thrilled to have partnered with the Danforth Center on Religion and Politics, and we look forward to future fruitful collaborations. Thank you so much to Deborah and Hannah for all of your expertise and assistance in making this event possible. The process has truly been a pleasure. Dr. Arthur Gale is a board certified physician and held a private practice of internal medicine for over 50 years. He is an associate clinical professor emerita of internal medicine at Washington University School of Medicine. More recently, he founded the Gale Family Annual Lecture Series on the Holocaust at the St. Louis Kaplan Feldman Holocaust Museum, the Medical Arts Speaker Series at the St. Louis County Library, and the annual Jewish Live Series Lecture at the Jewish Book Festival. He is a scholar of many topics, and his dedication to promoting broad literacy on a wide variety of subjects has enriched our community for many years. The Arthur Gale Jewish Live Series was established about seven years ago with a noble purpose to present outstanding authors who have written books about individuals who have made significant contributions to American or Jewish life. It is now my pleasure to introduce Andrew Meyer, who embodies the spirit of the Jewish Book Festival and the Gale Jewish Live series. Andrew Meyer is the author of two previous award-winning works of nonfiction, Black Earth, A Journey Through Russia After the Fall, and The Lost Spy, an American and Stalin secret service. Black Earth has been widely hailed as one of the best books on Russia to appear since the end of the USSR. The Lost Spy unearths the story of Isaiah or Cy Augens, the first known American to spy for the Soviets, a devout believer who survived the Gulag only to be killed on Stalin's personal orders. Both were named to a number of book of the year lists. A former Moscow correspondent for Time, Meyer has contributed to the New York Times Magazine, among numerous other national and international publications for more than two decades. His work has been recognized with fellowships from the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library and the Leon Levy Center for Biography, as well as the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, and the Alicia Patterson Foundation. In addition to appearing as a commentator on the BBC, CNN and NPR. Meyer has reported for PBS television documentaries and co-directed the Netflix documentary, Our Godfather from 2019. A graduate of Wesleyan and Oxford universities, Meyer teaches at the New School in New York City where he helped to launch the country's first ever journalism and design program. Welcome Andrew Meyer. Thank you all. Um, thank you to the uh, festival, to Dr. Gale, your family, the Danvoort Center, 
uh, and most of all to you. Can you all hear me in the back? Terrific. Just raise your hand if you can't hear me. Um, on a beautiful morning, I think it's a Friday, uh, to have so many people come out uh, is rather um, extraordinary. And as I've been speaking on this book, um, I've learned a lot about where we are in this country in terms of appreciation of um, history. And of course, I don't need to tell you all how we meet at a time um, of great precarity and great importance uh, in St. Louis, across the country, and certainly around the world. So uh, I look forward, I was joking beforehand that I might be asking you some questions. Um, that's only half a joke. I would love to hear um, from you all how you feel where we are today and, and also um, some of the solutions that may have maybe presented in this book. Um, I wanted to begin um, just with a very short clip if we have that, thank you. This is, um, well, it's self-explanatory, I hope. Thanks. So, thanks very much. So, some of you may recognize some of the people in that uh, film. And uh, that obviously, the fellow, uh, the larger fellow in his um, um, white uniform, uh, it actually wasn't a naval uniform, it was a kind of a crazy costume that Churchill liked to wear during the war, especially when he was traveling, um, is the Prime Minister of England, of course, Winston Churchill. Uh, and many of you no doubt recognize FDR, um, but in a way, at least those uh, I've learned, uh, including my own parents, you never saw him during his lifetime, um, relaxed, smoking, of course, and drinking. And the uh, uh, gentleman in between is Henry Morgenthau Jr., the Secretary of Treasury under Roosevelt, uh, and to this day, one of the longest serving cabinet members in US history. Uh, the woman who was in pink wearing long socks because she had uh, a rare blood disease and those were constrictive socks to increase circulation is Eleanor Morgenthau and Eleanor Roosevelt, her best friend, uh, the first lady is also there. And the young guy who's wearing his navy whites with the telltale back of the hand wiping the shrimps away after the shrimp after the president and the prime minister left is Bob Morgenthau. Um, on home, this uh, on home leave during World War II, the future DA. And this takes place in June 1942. It looks like, and it was, uh, another Sunday uh, afternoon at Fishkill Farms, the, the Morgenthau family farm, not far away from Roosevelt's own uh, estate in Hyde Park. It's about 25 minutes drive along bumpy roads in Dutchess County, upstate New York. Would you look at that and you see a number of things which fascinated me, but I only learned many years later after I first saw it, that that afternoon actually, um, just before that, the prime minister and the president had discussed something called tube alloys. And if any of you saw the movie Oppenheimer recently, you may know that the Brits were, before the Manhattan Project, the Brits were working on something called tube alloys, which of course uh, was the, the, um, the operation then secret. It's the very first time they discussed it to build the atomic bomb. You wouldn't know that by watching these people having cocktails uh, in the afternoon. And it speaks to the history. It also spoke um, to me, at least, to the way that I went around this book, and I'm going to, in a moment, if you'll indulge me, just read something I, I rarely do. This is a very heavy book, uh, 
and it's been on many flights on this book tour and only once have I had the opportunity to read it. So I thought I would do that. But before I, uh, I read it, very short passage, I wanted to talk a little bit about why that film clip uh, is important to start any discussion of the Morgenthau family and specifically my book. Dr. Joan uh, Morgenthau Hirshhorn, she was always known as Dr. Um, Joan Morgenthau, uh, during her life was a very distinguished um, pediatrician, um, professor of medicine in New York City. She taught, I believe, until her late 90s. She's an extraordinary woman who founded the first youth um, uh, free medical clinic in East Harlem out of a trailer. It grew to two trailers, and it still continues to this day. Many of you may know it. Uh, she was an extraordinary pioneer. As she moved from her house into a facility with her husband, she found a lot of old materials, the proverbial shoe boxes in the attics and the drawers, uh, the Morgenthaus, partly a blessing, but certainly my burden, were pack rats. They kept everything. Um, and there were millions and millions of pages of documents, some of which I'll, I'll, I'll speak about today. But in Dr. Jones' trash can, we found old home, they're not videos, they're film, that the Secretary of the Treasury had taken. He obviously didn't take that because he's pictured in it. But these are the actual home films that the Morgenthau family um, had and preserved over the years. There's the royal visit uh, to America, the first royal visit, all kinds of behind the scenes images. And that was interesting that we found that in the trash. And then when we looked at it, we saw this afternoon. Some people looking at it didn't know what this was. I knew about it because I had met the DA. And this was one of his great stories, how he had served not only the president and the first lady, but the prime minister, uh, mint juleps, FDR's favorite. And young Bob would always make mint juleps. And he would tell the story how the prime minister uh, took one sip of the mint juleps and poured it on the grass. And he said, give me my whiskey. And there you see actually the whiskey. Uh, I'm gonna return to the extraordinary relationship that the, the four of them, Mr. and Mrs. Roosevelt and the Morgenthaus had uh, in a moment. That's really the crux of the book. It's four generations. Um, and I will briefly gallop, we'll do a little bit of time traveling through each of those generations. But at the, at the, the center of the book, the spine of the book is that relationship between the Roosevelts and the Morgenthaus. Uh, but first, I'm going to read just, don't worry, uh, don't be alarmed. It's just one page. I never look back. In a career unlike any other in the annals of American law, he prosecuted every order of crime and every species of criminal, bribe takers and bribe givers serial killers and drug dealers, mobbed up families and mobbed up industries, molesters and rapists, stalkers and terrorists, gun, runner, gun runners and gamblers, prostitutes and vigilantes, loan sharks and digital pirates, bookmakers and boiler room operators, arms dealers and insider traders. He had seen the good go bad. Crooked politicians, crooked cops, crooked bakers, crooked truckers, crooked union bosses, crooked bankers, crooked accountants, crooked ambassadors, crooked priests, crooked rabbis, crooked doctors, crooked coroners, crooked engineers, crooked PTA officers, crooked CIA agents, crooked philanthropists, crooked turnpike authority executives, crooked traders, crooked defense attorneys, crooked prosecutors, crooked judges, and crooked inspectors of everything made in New York City, from its stakes to its skyscrapers to the cement of Yankee Stadium. There were crimes of passion too, but few by comparison. The urge always seemed to start and end with money. Money was the oxygen. Stop the flow, he would say, and you will stop the crime. Now, after 35 years as a district attorney of New York County, Robert Morris Morgenthau, at 90 years old, was leaving the job. That's the beginning of the book. It's a long book. Uh, it's 150 years of New York, US, and world history. Uh, but it really began um, on that night. That's the last night 
uh, of Robert Morgenthau's tenure as uh, district attorney. And anyone who knows anything about law enforcement, I should say it's good to be in court, at least moot court. Um, it's the first time I've given a talk uh, in this setting, and it's great to be here. Anyone who knows anything about law enforcement in New York knows the name uh, Robert Morgenthau. When I began this quest, people said, you realize what you're up against. He is the Pope of New York City law enforcement. Um, I think he actually might have imagined himself as the Pope of New York. Um, he was very good friends with Cardinal O'Connor. He was very good friends with Cardinal um, Egan as well. But Robert Morgenthau cast a very long shadow, not only in New York City, but I think across um, the legal profession nationally and internationally. We met in the spring of 2008. He was 89 years old. He was as sharp uh, of mind and body as anyone I've ever met. Uh, I got to know him very, very well. Uh, his wife, the late Lucinda Franks, at one point said, uh, you now know him better than almost anybody, including myself. And he didn't um, bless the book. It was not an authorized in any way biography, either of, of the DA or his family. But without um, his acceptance of my endeavor, uh, really more with a wink than anything else, there would be no book. Uh, and that goes true, true to his sister Joan, I mentioned, his older brother, who liked to say that he was, uh, would call Bob the DA, his kid brother, who passed away at 102. Um, the DA died at 99, 10 days short of his, cent uh, his century. Uh, and he would be, I know, furious that his older brother beat him by two years. Um, there was an intense sibling rivalry. So those are the three uh, children of the Secretary of Treasury. And that was really my entry point. Um, and I'm just going to walk you through briefly the dynasty, focusing um, on the men, but also being sure to highlight the women who stood not behind them, not aside them, but often in front of them. Um, this gentleman get that, is Lazarus Morgenthau. He is um, the patriarch, the first to come to New York. Um, and after that first scene with the DA on his last night, uh, we began in 1866. And thank goodness I didn't have to do the Civil War. Uh, Lazarus came from Germany. He has a very unusual background, as some of you may know. He uh, goes from poor to rich to poor again, um, even really before he came to America. He had been a cigar baron. He grew up in a very large, very poor, very orthodox family in what is today Bavaria, southern Germany. He broke free of every single stricture you can imagine, whether it was his faith, whether it was his region. Um, he, uh, I, I didn't know much about him when I started this journey. Uh, and then at some point, the DA said, now you know more about um, my great grandfather than I do. I found in an archive at the New York Public Library, Lazarus's diary. It's actually called a Lebensgeschichte. Many of you here will know that. He wrote it um, in 1842 at the ripe old age of 27 on the eve of his marriage. Uh, this was a guy uh, who not just uh, had, but epitomized chutzpah. He, um, that white um, bow tie, uh, no doubt made it himself. He specialized, he moves from being a cantor to then um, an itinerant singer to then making his own cravats, which he would wear in the middle of the synagogue. This was still, of course, in Germany. Uh, he was an inventor. Um, he invented all kinds of homeopathic uh, uh, medicines, syrups, various uh, health tonics, but he really made his money in cigars. And uh, like many German Jewish families, he did extremely well um, making cigars in Germany. But his twist was that he invented a, uh, a cigar box that would preserve the cigars such that they could go to um, a distant brother who was in California. And he sold, as improbable as it is, he sold the cigars from Germany to the gold miners in California and made a fortune. At his peak, he employed over a thousand people. He had three cigar plants in Germany, 
and he owned the largest mansion in Mannheim, his adopted city. He started one of the main themes of the whole family, which continues to this day, which was reaching out across faith. As I said, he broke free of his own strictures. He also had this wonderful ability uh, to make alliances and build um, very close allies. He worked with the Catholic Church. He worked with the Protestant Church. He actually became a member of the Free Thinkers. He was an inventor. He self-invented again and again. And he was something of a gambler. By the time he comes to America, he's near broke. He rents uh, uh, an apartment house not far, about two blocks from where I now live in Brooklyn, New York. And he goes to Manhattan and rents an enormous, gorgeous east side brownstone that I would learn he couldn't even afford to heat. In that brownstone, he creates something called the Temple of Humanity. I won't go into the details, but I'll just tell you, it was a brilliant idea, and it was also a hustle. I was able to find from his son, Henry Morgenthau, who was today is known as Henry uh, Sr. Henry Morgenthau was never known as Sr. Um, in his lifetime. Uh, he is the ninth son, um, sorry, the ninth child and the middle son of Lazarus and Babette. Babette Morgenthau, whose maiden name might be familiar, Guggenheim, was the long-suffering, long-serving wife of Lazarus. 14 children in 23 years, not all of whom survived, of course. And she had to put up with Lazarus's, let me just say, eccentricities. He was both verbally abusive, but also quite likely, as I, I write in the book, physically abusive as well. And the letters among the cho their children are heartrending to read. In the midst of all of this chaos at home, young Henry has to quit school. He was a product of New York City public schools. He arrived at age nine and never lost his German accent and had this incredible love affair, first of all, with New York and second of all, with America. And he goes to law school in those days, and I'm told that you can still do this without uh, getting an undergraduate BA. He passed the exams and was admitted to Columbia Law. He obviously did exceedingly well. And he wrote his father, Lazarus, and he, it's, it's liminal. You can't really say 100%, um, but he warns him, what you're doing is illegal. And there were various schemes Lazarus was doing, much of which are in the book, um, including that Temple of Humanity, where he was nominally raising money uh, for orphan brides, but the temple had images for paint, four portraits of Moses, Jesus Christ, Martin Luther, and one Lazarus, Morgenthau. And there are the wonderful photographs, uh, wonderful um, news reports including St. Louis papers. This was a national story. It was a tabloid story of uh, who is this uh, fellow, Lazarus Morgenthau, um, who invented quite a few things, um, some of which were, uh, he had many patents, um, but essentially he was a hustler. He was a gambler. Henry was anything but. Out of that chaos, out of the ruins of his father's demise, Lazarus ends up alone in a single room after having been institutionalized by his children, kept at bay literally by the Pinkerton guards during Henry's birthday, all sorts of melodrama. He dies alone with the sheriff coming to repossess his furniture. Henry in law school decides this isn't the way I'm going to do it. And he steadfastly records and with a very deliberate measure imitates his mentor um, who had been a a quote, uh, hang on, a Quaker hunchback doctor, one of the boarders in that brownstone they couldn't afford to heat. And through Dr. Whittle, he finds a different path. He, he finds Emerson, Ben Franklin. He goes to from church to church to church on Sundays on a spiritual walkabout. He's far away from uh, the uh, Orthodox circles in Southern Germany. And of course, in time, he discovers real estate and he makes a fortune in real estate at the turn of the century. 
at a time when New York real estate was controlled by one family, essentially, the Astors. They owned, they rented, they never sold. And Henry Morgenthau, I was able to go through the titles and deeds his papers, he's one of the one of the great pack rats of American history. His papers are in the Library of Congress, more than a million pages, also at the FDR Library um, in Hyde Park in upstate New York um, and elsewhere, some still privately held. He kept every single scrap of paper imaginable, uh, tickets, receipts, and most of all, his own diaries. There's diaries and diaries and diaries. He had three different forms, some of which I reproduce in the book, for keeping track um, of his own thoughts, his own sins, most importantly. He had an extreme moral rectitude. Out of all of that comes a genius. There are really two types of Henry Morgenthau's genius, which uh, the only thing greater than his genius was his ego. And unfortunately, Henry Morgenthau was his own worst um, ambassador. He becomes best known in history as the ambassador um, to Constantinople, to Turkey, witness to the Armenian genocide. But as a young man, he was moved most of all by two main uh, forces. One, search for talent. He was always looking for talent. Again, that sense of who can be my ally, and not only who can help me, but who can understand my talents and can I can help him and we can build an alliance for something greater. And two, he really did appreciate New York in a way that very few people, uh, men or women at his time did. And he looked and he saw at the turn of the century, really even before that in the 1890s, still a young man with not many with not much means he saw the arrival of a great flood of immigrant labor and he also saw the engineering advances he saw steel and he saw that the city would move not only north as many as five blocks per year was being built in manhattan at that time of course you know it only went uh, to central park and he also saw the vertical city and these two things at the same time, a very large light bulb went off and he thought, well, real estate. And he went to the Astors and he got John Jacob Astor to sell uh, for the first time. He becomes one, if not the first great real estate bundler in New York. He creates something, he didn't call it bundling, he called it a syndicate. And he built most of um, uh, Northern Manhattan, most of the Bronx, much of Harlem, he becomes a real estate titan. Not alone, uh, he had delusions of grandeur, of course, and then he would have his own comeuppance and would revert back to the Henry Morgenthau, um, his own company called Henry Morgenthau uh, and Company. But most of the big buildings along Wall Street, he had a hand in. The Plaza Hotel, many, many landmarks. Perhaps most important, and again, in that sense of building an alliance, was Times Square. His closest friend was Adolf Ox. Many of you know, was the publisher of the New York Times. The, pub, the Times had been a small paper, heavily in debt. And Adolf Ox comes um, to New York City and he meets Henry Morgenthau. Henry helps him not only buy the paper, but build this thing called um, the Times Building and actually creates the name of Times Square. So that's a relationship that lasts really to this day, but certainly throughout the book, generation after generation of Morgenthau's and first Ox and now Salzburgers are families that are very, very close. The other family, this is the treasurer's secretary looking in his usual bright, happy way. He was not a, a great smiler. He Roosevelt called him Henry the Morgue. Um, <laughs> He, he was in, uh, always characterized in the press and by people who knew him very well, including his own family, as a glower. He was always in the corner. Uh, he was a terrible public speaker. He hated speaking. He would always be wringing his hands quite literally. He suffered on the public stage. He had migraines. He had terrible health problems because of this. And that is rather a typical look uh, of Henry. One of the other nice things about that film clip I showed is that he's actually laughing. Uh, he was a great singer. He had a wonderful baritone. He was a very good athlete. 
um, none of which uh, was known to the public. What I was able to find out is that Henry Morgenthau was not a new dealer. He was in, in hundreds or thousands of books on Roosevelt and the New Deal. He's always miscast. Uh, he was fiscally conservative. He was not a great reader. One of the first things I did was I went to go see the Yale historian, John Morton Blum, who had spent more than a decade uh, with the Secretary of Treasury trying to turn his diaries, yet yet more documents, um, 900 volumes of the Morgenthau diaries in the Roosevelt libraries, turn them into three volumes. And that's what John Morton Blum did for his sins. He said, I don't think Morgenthau, this is Henry Jr., ever read a book cover to cover. He was nearsighted, but he also had undiagnosed dyslexia. And as I say in the book, he never graduated Cornell. He failed twice. He never even graduated prep school, one of the longest serving cabinet members in US history. But he did, like his father, have a genius for talent spotting. And also, uh, it may well be part of that dyslexia. He was in the right place at the right time. He could see the far horizon. And Roosevelt certainly appreciated that. He could see at a time when the bureaucracy, like Manhattan had, ex had um, expanded exponentially as his father was coming up, when Henry arrives in Washington, uh, even before he took over the treasury, the New Deal was expanding not only the bureaucracy, but the city itself. And at, the, at its peak, the treasury was an empire over 35,000 employees. And this man without a high school degree was in charge of it. Yeah, I won't go into all the details, but it was the, the Secret Service, the Coast Guard, treasury agents around the world. Um, and he, one of the things that I really tried to show is that he was badly miscast. Yes, um, others in the, in the uh, Roosevelt cabinet said, well, Henry didn't know anything about finance. It's true, he didn't. Um, and Roosevelt wanted to be his own treasury secretary, which was true. And um, uh, Henry Wallace, the secretary of agriculture, the job that Henry Morgenthau really wanted, Wallace would say, and it's in his diaries, uh, the one thing that Roosevelt loved about Morgenthau is that he got his bootleg liquor for him during Prohibition. And as you can see in the film, that's true. Uh, he certainly did uh, know how to please Roosevelt, but he was more than just a bootlicker. And they had an extraordinarily strong bond. FDR was the sun god, not just his best friend. For Henry Jr., FDR was everything. And as you can see, not in just in that you know minute clip, there was an intimacy there that wasn't just one way. FDR also appreciated and admired Henry, not just for his loyalty. Yes, he was loyal. There are terrible, terrible documents in the, in among the Morgenthau papers where you see Henry um, just uh, anguished by an inability to tell Roosevelt really how he felt. And he never wanted to be the special pleader he certainly didn't want to be, and he was, the lone Jew in the cabinet. FDR appreciated Henry for one reason above all others, and there are several chapters in the book when I talk about this. Henry had the ability to get things done. He could see a plan and fulfill it, and he was dogged. It's a, tra it's a, it's a trait that runs throughout the family, and anyone who ever met the DA, Robert Morgenthau, knows one thing. He was a guy you never could say no to. Father was very much the same. Six in the morning, he would start making calls. Uh, he, the record of his time in the Treasury is extraordinary. How many meetings, how many calls, how many reports he reviewed and personally edited. Um, it's an extraordinary uh, record and a toll that, that um, he endured throughout his time in Washington. Roosevelt sent him on missions very quickly. The recognition of the Soviet Union Obviously, since 1917, we did not recognize the Soviet Union until 1933. That was Henry Morgenthau's work. And then the preparation for the war, first rearming Europe, the Brits and the French, 
I found a document, just a little small, they would pass what they called chits, little pieces of paper. It was a boys club, except for Mrs. Mrs. Perkins, the Secretary of Labor, at Cabinet. Henry and FDR had lunch, the only Cabinet member, every Monday alone. Henry also sat at Roosevelt's, literally on his right uh, during Cabinet, and they would pass each other notes, like boys in school. Uh, sometimes they would make fun of Mrs. Perkins' hats. Those chits exist. Um, but there was a note scribbled where Henry writes, in the spring of 1933, one of the great ironies of history, Roosevelt comes to power at the same time, of course, as Adolf Hitler. And Morgenthau, because of his father, because of the history, um, writes to FDR, do you think there will be war in Europe? And FDR writes back, yes. Henry writes, and do you think we will have to go in, meaning to help the French uh, and the Brits? And Roosevelt writes again, almost certainly, yes. 1933. And so even though there were many others, not just Hopkins, Harold Ickes, and later Stimson in the cabinet who had very different ideas about the threat uh, and what in Europe and what America should do, never mind the American firsters on Capitol Hill. That bond between Henry and FDR was very, very strong for reasons that I, I hope and I've heard from readers. Uh, it reviews that in ways that, that people hadn't seen or had forgotten. That FDR had been in Europe as a young boy. He had been in Germany. And very much like a recent president um, of our country, he had two or three things that stayed in his mind. And it all had to do with German militarism. It was about the uniforms. It was about the marching bands. And throughout the war, that's what he keeps coming to Henry, his close friend, about. When Henry Morgenthau is talking first and foremost about arming in contravention of US law, the Brits uh, and the French, Roosevelt is very much aware of really, he meant Prussian militarism on the rise in uh, in Germany. And of course, that's what they did. They managed to rearm Europe before Detroit uh, and Los Angeles, McConnell Douglas, all the big uh, industrial firms were on a civilian basis. And it was an extraordinary record that Henry, he wasn't alone, but he really did lead out as Secretary of the Treasury and the War Department and many other uh, interior, many other people said, you know, what's Henry doing um, out of his lane? He was far out of his lane uh, many, many times. He stuck his neck out for, um, for Roosevelt. And the most important time he stuck his neck out was, of course, uh, during the Holocaust in 1944 when uh, over 18 months, the word of the horrors coming from Europe were coming to Washington and coming to Henry's desk at the Treasury. He he would later call them those 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 terrible 18 months. He literally had physical manifestations. He had migraines every night. He didn't sleep. He worked 18 hours at the Treasury. And a group of young Treasury lawyers, not one of whom was Jewish, really pushed Henry to do something to save to rescue the last Jews of Europe. And again, he was reluctant to do so. He didn't want to be a, a special pleader. He didn't want to confront his best friend, the president. And yet, uh, in January 1944, after a year and a half since the Wannsee Conference in January of 1942, it becomes known as the final solution. And they had very good information, very close intelligence, a long report which is online, if you haven't read it, I would urge you all to read it. Uh, those lawyers drafted for the Secretary of Treasury a report to the president on the acquiescence of this government, the United States government, in the murder of the Jews. For Henry, it was too much. He crossed out that title and wrote just special report to the president. That led to the War Refugee Board, which although we'll never know the full tally, at least 250,000 Jews, the best estimates say, uh, were saved. Of course, it was far too little, far too late, but for Henry, it really was his crowning achievement. 1945, he is with the president on his last night that he's alive. 
uh, in April of the next day. Roosevelt, of course, suffers a fatal stroke. And Henry's career uh, really meets a tragic end. After 12 years in Washington and more than two decades at Roosevelt's side before that, he loses his best friend. He loses his own wife, Eleanor Morgenthau, uh, Mrs. Roosevelt's closest friend. And then he also loses his father, Henry Sr. He goes on to head uh, UJA. He does a lot of fundraising. He takes uh, Golda Meyerson, um, Golda Meir, on her first fundraising trip across the United States, raises the first money for Israel um, from American Jews. And Israel offers him, I was able to find out, uh, the DA thought that moved to the DA, that's Robert Morgenthau, um, in his 90s. Um, he told me, you know, Andrew, my father was offered the um, to be finance minister of Israel. And you really couldn't find that anywhere. It wasn't written down anywhere. I was able to find it in um, an oral history of those, uh, those members of these um, soon to be Israeli government who had met with him. They did want uh, Henry Jr. to be secretary of the, the first finance minister of Israel, a job he refused, as his father had done in Turkey. The Turks had also said to Henry Sr. when he was the American ambassador, we'd like you to be finance minister. The Morgenthau that I knew best, of course, was the DA. Um, there he is looking uh, not at all like his father, uh, rather imperious. His successor, Cyrus Vance, said he was not only prickly, he was imperious. Um, you wouldn't want to get on his bad side. And I know from experience, uh, I can't say, uh, I can't quote in this polite company, let alone in this august setting, some of the things he said when to me when I said, well, you know, uh, Mr. Morgenthau, you know, I checked the documents or I checked in the archives and uh, what you told me is, is, is checked out. <laughs> there was no better way to get what his his kids call the scowl, um, followed by some very salty language. He was um, a sailor, uh, and he retained that language. And it was really, um, I'm going to speak for another five minutes or so, because I want to uh, make sure I have time for questions. It was really the war, which I don't know if there are four or five chapters in this book on the war, something of which I knew very little about, World War II, of course, he had 54 continuous months of active duty, six ships, seven captains. He tried to volunteer at 19, like his cousin, who was a Lehman, like on his mother's side, he's a member of the Lehman family. Uh, Pete Lehman had volunteered in Canada. Bob Morgenthau tried to do that um, as a sophomore at Amherst College in Massachusetts. He volunteered finally uh, at, um, at 19 and enlisted in the Navy. He was too young. He had to bring the paper back for his father, the Secretary of the Treasury, and his mother to sign because he wasn't 21 years old. He served first in the Mediterranean and then in the Pacific only after his ship was sunk. And he was the number two. He wasn't uh, the captain, but he ran the ship. He was the, what was known as the exec, the executive commander. 19, 20, 21 years old. He lost 49 men that night, and he swam in tread water in the Mediterranean just north of Algeria. And I asked him about that night many, many times. And then I realized it was April 20th, 1944. It was Hitler's birthday. It's an attack that was not well known, but the Germans knew about it. It was in the German press. It was actually on German uh, radio, a gift to the, a gift to the Fuhrer. And Bob Morgenthau would always talk about that time and talk about the war. It was one of the few times in the hundreds of hours we spent together where he would slip into the present tense. As you, many of you no doubt know, uh, some uh, anyone maybe of that stature, but particularly New York, particularly our crowd, the German Jews, not necessarily tending to do reflection, uh, not, not necessarily uh, willing or wanting to um, toot their own horn. And he would talk about that night and other exploits during the war, and he would always talk about others. And one time I asked him uh, a really dumb question, but it ended up being a good question. I said, you know, I'm interviewing all the other survivors, most of whom have since left us, uh, of that night. 
And they all talk about wearing the life preservers, the May West, for reasons you can imagine, they called them May West. And uh, did you, you know, you tread water in the Mediterranean, which was cold all night in the dark until the, the Coast Guard cutters came and, and collected you. What happened to your life preserver? Did you have one? And it was, must have been the third or fourth or fifth time he had told me the story of that, that attack. And he said, oh, I gave it away. And I will never forget that. He gave away his life preserver before he, uh, and he was the second to last person to leave the sinking ship. He then went to the Pacific, got married. Um, and in the Pacific, he was there in time for Okinawa, Iwo Jima. There are two chapters in the book on that when I tried to recreate in real time what it was like to face wave after wave after wave of kamikazes. And that was the least of it. The kamikazes they could see. It was the torpedo bombs that actually um, were the greatest danger. And of course, he survived all of that. And he went to Yale Law in two years. Long story short, he could have been governor, a job he very much wanted. He could have been mayor, a job he didn't want. He was offered federal judgeships. He was offered cabinet um, uh, post time. And again, Lyndon Johnson famously tried to get him out. Um, uh, as U.S. attorney, he was uh, for a decade, um, still, I think, the longest serving U.S. attorney in the Southern District. We all know most Americans have had an education in the Southern District, again, thanks to our former president. And um, all of that were things that he thought about. But what he really loved, of course, was being DA. And as I said at the beginning, he was DA for 35 years, really reigning over New York City law enforcement for 50 years, all told. And when I got to know him uh, in, his, uh, in his 89th year and then in through his 90s, he would be going on talk after talk after talk. He wrote hundreds of op-eds still. He wrote about immigration. He wrote about veterans' rights, cared very deeply about veterans' rights. And he cared about the state of Israel. Um, and he would go on these talks and inevitably he was introduced uh, with all the accompanying accolades. My favorite was this, Bob Morgenthau, who was DA of New York County, not, not New York and uh, not Manhattan, but New York County for 35 years, was DA really for life and maybe after. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Let me have, see if we have time for some questions. Okay, any questions? I will bring the mic to you. How did the Morgenthau's get back into Judaism? Because clearly there was a break in there uh, from the, the, the first of the Morgenthau's to the involvement of the secretary and then uh, the, the DA. How did that take place? Yeah, it's a great question. So it's not just Judaism, it's Zionism as well, that this family, again, it's little appreciated, but one of the things I tried to bring out in the book is that there are very few, if any, American families who over three generations, at least, discounting the errant Lazarus, the patriarch, over three generations held such high levels of public office. Uh, there's obviously the Adams, um, and maybe you could say the Bushes, but uh, any uh, American family, let alone a Jewish American family. Uh, so that's the first thing that distinguished them. The other thing, of course, is this very sort of um, uh, dysfunctional relationship with Zionism. And Henry Morgenthau, as many of you no doubt know, the ambassador, he was known as Uncle Henry in the Democratic Party because he was the money bags. FDR called him Uncle Henry. He was the finance, um, going back to Woodrow Wilson, he was the finance uh, guy in the Democratic Party. Henry wrote, which is quoted, and I saw it yesterday, someone will inevitably send it to me today, um, Zionism is our greatest fallacy. Uh, he wrote that. It was a public letter. We have quite a few public letters going around right now. Henry was a master of the public letter. And then he would take out a full page ad in the New York Times and every other publication he could afford, which were quite a few. He was the literally the most vocal anti-Zionist, not just in America, but perhaps in the world. And the reason for that is complex. 
but essentially, as I tried painstakingly to go from the archive to the page, he believes it goes back to Emerson and Ben Franklin and his own rise through real estate and through New York. Our Zion is here. He believed in it's partly social gospel. It's his own, he called it the American gospel. Partly it's his own hubris. It's his own ego. I can create my own uh, theology, my own ideology. And he did. He had the temerity to lecture the Turks, in, the young Turks, right, uh, in 1915. But also, uh, I, I couldn't get into details in the talk, but during in Constantinople, he becomes the most important ambassador. Obviously, the guns of August, that's his granddaughter, uh, Barbara Tuchman, uh, the great historian who was, a, as a toddler, visited grandpa. And he would go around and proselytize, not just to the Turks as the American ambassador, but also to the American missionaries who were stationed there and also the corporate interests, um, oil, among others. Those were the three groups uh, that Henry Morgenthau would try to proselytize to this idea that our Zion is here. And he tried to convince the Turks through hard work. I mean, it's Horatio Alger. You too uh, can do everything I've done. And he really believed it. It sounds corny, but he really did believe it. Did he um, uh, have sympathy with the Zionist cause? At times, yes. From Constantinople, um, he goes to um, Palestine. He goes to the Holy Land. And he makes something that he called it a pilgrimage. But when he's there, he's moved spiritually. But as I say in the book, quoting really his letters and his diary at the time, he was moved as much by the Muslim faith and the Christian faith um, and the Armenians as by the settlers, the Yishuv, whom he met, the, some of the most important later um, members of the Yishuv. Uh, Dr. Rupin he met and was hosted. Um, ben Gurion, he helped get out of jail um, as his, in his capacity as ambassador. He's moved spiritually, but not to become a Zionist. And it's a very complicated relationship uh, he has with um, the Holy Land, as he called it. Uh, and actually, Barbara Tuckman, his granddaughter, later writes um, a fantastic scholarly article called The Assimilationist Dilemma, and that's about her grandfather. Henry Morgan thought, because he did give the first money uh, from America to those Jewish settlers. Um, he was instrumental, of course, in uh, saving the Yeshiv. But he breaks with Zionism, and he writes that letter, Zionism is uh, our greatest fallacy. His son, Junior, the Secretary of Treasury, grows up essentially um, as a New Yorker first. Um, uh, with very little understanding of Judaism practice or uh, theory. They had a Christmas tree, their Christmas cards every year. And there's an extraordinary letter which some members of the family dispute, uh, uh, but it's there in the letter. He writes, he used, as I said, that dyslexia. He didn't write, he dictated and he used um, an Edison machine, something called an Ediphone. And the boys, the two boys, Henry III was with General Patton, during the war in Germany, and Bob is in the Pacific on the destroyer. And he writes, dear boys, he says, dear boys, I have to tell you, last night I had the most extraordinary experience. He had been in, in Florida. Uh, I went to a dinner by the local Jewish community, something called a Seder. Well, there it is uh, in black and white. And that is the spring of 1945. Yeah. And the reason why he went was because his wife, Ellie, who you saw in the film, uh, again, in ill health, had had a heart attack, and she was in a military hospital in Daytona. And moreover, uh, it's in the book, and Michael Beschloss also um, uh, cited in a recent book, there's a letter we found, I found in the archives, by one Gertrude Liner, who's a local resident of Daytona, and she writes, Dear Mr. Morgenthau, dear Secretary Morgenthau, I know you're staying at the Sheraton, Please don't. Do you know they don't allow Jews? And of course, he stayed there. Um, that is a, a roundabout way of answering your question. Um, but that's their relationship to Judaism. And of course, 
uh, after the war, he does embrace, he heads UJA, he does em em embrace uh, at least the fundraising aspect of it and the idea of Israel. There is uh, a Moshav named after Henry Morgenthau Jr., uh, Tal Shachar, which means morning dew, um, you know, Morgenthau, uh, those of you non-German speakers. And he went to Israel several times. He thought for a time about moving to Israel, but he didn't. Uh, Ellie, his dear wife, died young, at uh, um, 57, and he remarried. He married a non-Jew, a French woman who at that time actually was married. It's all in the books. So the most, the greatest scandal, someone told me early on, well, there a member of the family said, you know, there's no sex in his family and there's no, there's no skeletons. Well, the, one of the great skeletons I found was the headline, uh, the wedding announcement in the New York Times saying that Mrs. Putan misses to marry Henry, <laughs> Henry uh, uh, Morgenthau Jr. That was the scandal. And what did they do? She being French, she persuaded the, t the secretary to, of course, build a villa in Antibes in the south of France, and they called it Villa Morning Dew. And he really didn't have that much to do with his uh, Jewish causes uh, for the rest of his life. The DA, though, the pendulum swings back, the DA, as many of you know, was one of the greatest uh, supporters of Israel, a devout Zionist, to the point that on his honeymoon, he goes and visits Ariel Sharon. And Sharon came to that farm as well, Fishkill Farms in upstate New York. Sharon has a farm, which I think uh, one of his children still runs, manages today. Um, and they were very close, personally close to Ariel Sharon. Um, and as in all things, Bob Morgenthau, as I mentioned, you couldn't say no to him. He found a way to make an ally who could be of use, not only to him, not only to Israel or to America, or vice versa, but most of all to his office. And uh, in many of the cases that I didn't talk about today, many of the cases during those 35 years, he worked very closely with the Israeli state. Uh, and that in part explains that kind of uh, very close friendship with Sharon. Was there a relationship with Robert Moses? There was a relationship there, and um, it's one of the few times that my great hero and mentor, um, Robert Carroll, uh, uh, got a little bit short and taciturn with me. Um, it's far too complex. It's uh, it's in the book, and then there's a footnote explaining it. Um, Moses and FDR, um, and though the, their acolytes around each other did not get along, and it dates to um, a misunderstanding as I see it, and Carol sees it a different way. Um, when Henry Morgenthau, I mentioned, he had been Roosevelt, at Roosevelt's side, uh, in Albany, Henry ran something called the Taconic. It was a highway project, the Taconic Parkway Commission. And it much of what he did with FDR in Albany, of course, prefigured, and it's a big part of the, the early part of the book, is how what they did, they, they tried out crazy trial balloons. Um, let's bring not a few hundred, but a few thousand of the Bowery boys, homeless youth, in New York City, let's put them on the train and put them upstate and see what they can do logging. Oh, does that sound familiar? That's what they did nationally a few years later, a decade later. Uh, they did all kinds of things like that. And of course, at that point, he bumped up against Robert Moses. And um, it's a complicated story, but the, antip the, the antipathy, the enmity was deep uh, between M Moses and not only Morgenthau Jr., the, the Treasury Secretary, it had less to do with New York politics than with Albany politics, not Manhattan politics. Yeah. Uh, and as far as the DA, no. No, it's one of the, you know, he, uh, he had longstanding feuds with Roy Cohn. He had longstanding feuds with J. Edgar Hoover. I found that Hoover had fingerprinted him when he was 15 on a visit to the, uh, to the, um, uh, Bureau of Investigation, then I think, when he was a young boy before it was the FBI. And uh, he met Hoover many times, butted heads with him um, and with many other, you know, sort of legendary uh, New York um, 
members of the political class, but not Moses, not with the DA, one of the few people. It's my understanding that um, at a time when the Jews were threatened in Europe, people began to understand the serious challenge that would lie ahead. And there was interest among Jews in having more people come to the United States. But immigration was not popular. What role did the Secretary of Treasury play in distancing the government from enhancing immigration by the Jews? Yeah, thank you. It's, a, it's an important, essential question. And it's one, again, that Roosevelt and Morgenthau, it's a little understood, at least by me, um, that Roosevelt cared deeply about immigration and he cared deeply about refugees or dis later displaced um, people. Rarely are they called Jews or Jewish refugees. And in fact, Henry was sensitive to that. They understood each other almost telepathically, the president and, uh, and Morgenthau. Uh, they would talk about refugees. And, you, and if you read the documents, you don't know that they're talking about Jews necessarily. Even before... Um, as I mentioned, before the war, they're worried about it. And interestingly enough, the Treasury Secretary turned to a man named Isaiah Bowman, who was a well-known, I guess he was a geographer uh, or an ethnographer, maybe both. He had all these maps, and there is a very good biography of him. He was at Johns Hopkins. And he knew Bowman from his father. I mentioned the ambassador, Morgan Dawes, uh, talent-spotting genius, Bowman had been in uh, Ambassador Morgenthau's uh, universe on his radar because they had been looking for where are we going to move the Armenians after the Armenian genocide. And there were all kinds of schemes. Some of them went uh, very high up to the League of Nations that were going to create um, essentially a safe haven for Armenians in America perhaps in Alaska, perhaps the West Coast, this idea that I'm a real estate uh, magnet, I can find land for anybody. Uh, and so that history was Isaiah Bowman's legacy sort of um, before the Holocaust. Roosevelt, meanwhile, also goes to Isaiah Bowman, and I have a chapter on this. And you have these two guys, the Treasury Secretary and the President, rolling out maps this is long before anything like the Morgenthau plan appears. And they're sectioning off. Well, let's look at, I don't know, Ecuador, Costa Rica, um, uh, North Africa. Where might it be hospitable land for these people? No mention of Jews. And Isaiah Bowman actually studied this, and there was a project. Uh, so there certainly was discussion of uh, where can we bring these people and where we can lead them? And of course, then uh, there's series of series of failures um, uh, under the auspices of the league conferences where no one will stand up and say, I'll take them, or very, very few nations will take them. The biggest obstacle was on Capitol Hill and ironically in the State Department, where we had World War I quotas and before World War I immigration quotas that would have to be, it was both a legal um, issue, but it was really a political issue. Nobody um, wanted to take the political risk of forcing the legal changes to increase those quotas. And there's a very, very good book by Rebecca Elberton called uh, On the War Refugee Board, where she goes into that in great detail, what the quotas were, what the obstacles to changing them were. Um, and it is a very dark passage uh, in American history. What I look at very closely is the Treasury Secretary's, your point, what his role. Again, he's sitting atop this massive bureaucracy. He's, whether it's the Coast Guard uh, or the Secret Service, he's intimately involved in Roosevelt's Secret Service, which the night of Pearl Harbor was no joke. Um, but he's also getting involved in licensing. And what are these licenses? So he has treasury agents around the world. The most famous, of course, becomes known, uh, unfortunately, as, uh, by the name, his name, Raoul Wallenberg. Uh, and 
these treasury secretaries, some officially members of the treasury, some unofficially, some members of uh, international uh, Jewish conferences in Geneva, uh, across Europe, are reporting to the treasury what the situation is with refugees. And they are the ones who are getting the word of the horror uh, through various sources, most famously the Regner cable, Gerhard Regner um, in Switzerland says, this is what's happening. This is what we hear, this is what we know. And there's even the phrase concentration camps and the final solution. At that time, Henry can take no more. And it's it's already uh, too much evidence has been accumulated. And that's when he raises literally what, and there's a, every time he went to see Roosevelt, he wrote up, uh, he did a memo to the file. And so you have a very close contemporaneous account. And he says, Mr. President, what are we gonna do about this refugee question? And he means, how are we gonna save the Jews? Uh, and again, as I said, it was too little too late but for Henry, that was his crowning moment. Does the family's real estate empire still exist? I'm sorry, does what still exist? The does the family's real estate empire still exist? Well, uh, the empire does not. Um, but do they have any holdings? Does any member of the family have any holdings that date to that early period of the 1880s, 1890s is a good question that I don't know the answer to. Um, the biggest uh, holdings they have is that farm, which at its height was about, uh, I think, 1,200 acres. It's now, I think, around 300 was portioned off. Fishco Farms is not only going 100 years on, is a thriving uh, for the first time, I think, <laughs> in its existence is in the black. Um, and they're, they're making, it's an apple farm and they're not only selling apples, they actually make treasury cider now, which has won all sorts of awards. Um, but that is uh, the DA's son, Joshua Morgenthau is running that. Um, for a long time, I know that they owned uh, several large buildings both on 14th Street in Manhattan and then also in the Bronx. Um, I think it was called the Hunt's Palace, Hunt's Palace, which was uh, sort of a ballroom entertainment area, as I understand. Um, I don't know if they still own that. I do know that um, some of the, it's, it's comp these four generations enough uh, is complicated, but then going back, so the Lehman family, of the Lehman brothers. Mayor Lehman was the DA's grand, great-grandfather on his maternal side. Mayor Lehman, the youngest of the three, uh, you know, the Cotton um, family, and then the finance family, uh, and then the nothing family. Uh, and on his fraternal side, of course, it was Lazarus Morgenthau, his great-grandfather. But the Lehman Trust from his grandmother still exists. Um, and I described that in the book. Uh, because it couldn't be touched. They can only draw the interest. They can never draw on the principal. So uh, I don't know about the holdings, but the money certainly, yes, goes back to the 19th century. We have time for one more. What do you think he loved about that post, the DA? Sorry, I didn't quite hear that. What, what did he love about that job? Oh, what did he love about being DA? Mm. Um, Well, the subtitle is Power, Privilege, and the Rise of an American Dynasty. Um, power, certainly, uh, as any DA knows, anywhere in the country, is enormous. Um, privilege, too, and I thought long and hard about including that in the subtitle. Um, it's the epigraph to the book is his grandfather, the ambassador, says to him, to the DA as a young man, um, I had to wait till I was 55 to enter public service. 55 is when he made his first couple of million dollars and he backed the governor of New Jersey, uh, Woodrow Wilson, who, by the way, one term, two years, uh, he was a talent spotter. 
no one really knew outside Princeton who Woodrow Wilson was. He certainly wasn't a national figure. And he was the son and grandson of Presbyterian ministers. And here comes this Jewish New York uh, real estate baron and says, you could be president and, uh, in 1911. And that's the talent spotter. He said to his grandson, I had to wait till I was 55 to enter public service, in large part because of the ruins that he grew up with, with Lazarus. And you don't to Bob. It's a privilege, meaning the privilege to serve. And again, it does sound corny and cliched. Uh, you know, you, you, do, uh, you, you do well to do good. And that's one of the things that they shared with the Roosevelt's, of course. Um, you know, the Morgan Dolls had money. And actually, uh, FDR thought they had more money than they really did. Um, uh, and the DA um, was certainly well off. Um, but he was not extraordinarily uh, wealthy as many of his contemporaries, associates, and friends um, uh, are in war. And he enjoyed that power and that privilege really to do good. Uh, he was the first to admit, and I go through five of his big cases over those 35 years, he was the first to admit when he screwed up. Again, as a sailor, he didn't use that word. He used a saltier version of it. Um, and he admitted it and he owned it. And it wasn't just about ego, which he certainly had. He had met every U.S. president since Calvin Coolidge, when I think he was six or seven years old. He not only had met every Supreme Court justice, uh, he, he had been tutored by uh, Felix Frankfurter. I found a note when he was at Yale in the summer, and, and, and Justice Frankfurter says, uh, that boy, who did not like either the ambassador or the not like is uh, to put it um, mildly was no fan of the Morgenthau's says of young Bob, you know, uh, he's got a good mind. He's probably going to go places. Uh, and, and of course, justice Sonia Sotomayor was just one of the most famous of his former protégés. Uh, so whether it's the family court in New York or whether it's the Supreme court, I think we're over a hundred former DAs. He cared about the office, and the book, not coincidentally, begins and ends with the DA's office. That really was his living um, uh, legacy, and he believed that the district attorney's office of New York County had to be the best. It had to be beyond reproach. He stole um, Adolf Ox, New York Times um, motto, uh, without fear or favor. He, as I describe in the book, without giving a scooping of myself, he chose, like there was definitely a King Lear moment at the end. He chose his own heir and ended up deeply regretting it, Cyrus Vance. And we now have in New York, I'm speaking as a New Yorker, uh, our first black American DA, um, Alvin Bragg. And actually, D.A. Bragg invited me to give a talk at the D.A.'s office, which was rather astounding. And I think the Morgenthau legacy is alive and well in that office and in many other offices around the country. Um, I think that's what he enjoyed most about it. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Our bookseller partner, Novel Neighbor, has books for sale just in the hallway, and then Andrew will be signing here. And we also have extra time if you uh, wanted extra dialogue with him. Thank you so much. Thank you. Is it? Thank you. Thank you. 